Well, tonight, get your Bibles out, and if you want to start somewhere, start with me in 2 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter number 5, and we'll get there in a minute. Uh, But while you're turning there, let me just tell you a little bit about tonight's message. The title of tonight's message is this, What It Is and How It Should Be. What it is and how it should be. Many times, I I get a little irked, you know, when I I listen to people talk and I listen to people in our society, and even listening to to Christians, you know, because I'm around a lot of Christians, being in the church world, being a pastor, I'm surrounded by people. And many times, the people that I come in contact with, uh, you know, I I hear different things, and I've got my ear to the ground. I'm listening for where people are at. And there's a common thread in our society, especially in our day and age, whether Christian or non-Christian, that people have this saying. It's a common phrase in our day. It's kind of one of the modern-day idioms that, that says it is what it is, right? Anybody ever heard that or said that, you know, that sort of a thing? Now, now, now we know that there is what it is, but we also know that there is an ideal of how it should be. Is that right? And, and, and when we resign ourselves to it is what it is, and we never look at how it should be or never work towards how it should be, I believe that's where we miss it. That's where we miss out on life. And there are things that we're going to go through in life that we're going to have to deal with. I know many times when when I see people that are dealing with issues in their life, one of the biggest ones that I see where it comes into conflict in our thinking that's probably most prevalent is that when someone gets sick, especially as a Christian, right, our health, oftentimes we say, well, oh, man, I got sick. It's just the season. It just is what it is. You know, I've had allergies all my life. I've, I've, I've dealt with these things. I've battled them. It is what it is. Every year during this time, I deal with the same issue. It just is what it is. And yet, God's word tells us that there is an ideal for our life, that God has a blessing for us, that God has provided for us healing. And yet we say, well, that's how it should be, Well, but it is what it is. And we resign ourselves and never work towards, well, what does God want from our life, and how do I get there? And I believe that this is going to be a place that all of us can find ourselves in. You know, uh, financially, we might see ourselves, and we might say, well, you know, I'm just at this education level. I, I've been at this job for this many years. I, they told me I hit my ceiling. It is what it is, right? And yet, the ideal of prosperity in the Word of God shows us how it should be, that we should be abundantly supplied for every good work. Now, I know that might be a thought, new thought to some of us in this room, like, wait a second, abundantly supplied for every good work? Well, does that mean that God will give me all the money I need? No, but it means you'll be abundantly supplied for every good work, right? See, true prosperity doesn't need money to be able to be prosperous, to be able to be successful. God can give you resource outside of what we think. Is that right? He's an amazing God. He's a mighty God. He's a supernatural God. Same thing with our marriages. You know, some, some of us have been married for a long time. I've been married this coming July 7th, 7, 7. We got married so that I would remember the date, you know. But uh, anyways, I'm just kidding. Kind of. All right. But, but we got married on 7, 7. And, and it's going to be, uh, this year's going to be 17 years. Praise the Lord. Now we get into it. Thank you. Yes. Praise the Lord. God's good. There are people in this room that have been married 50 years. They're going, you're just getting started, kid. But, it, but it's an amazing thing when I, when I hear people in marriage, they say, oh, we've been married 10 years, been married 20 years, been married 30 years. It just is what it is. You know, I've dealt with this. This is just how it's been, you know, and, and that's just my spouse. That's just the way. It, it is what it is. And yet God has an amazing plan for your marriage and wants you to have a great marriage. He wants you to have great kids. He wants you to be prosperous in life. He wants you to be blessed in your businesses. He wants you to succeed in life. And if we resolve that we're going to get to how it should be rather than just stay with what it is, it's okay to acknowledge what it is, by the way. You know, sometimes in the face circles, we get so messed up with, I'm not even going to speak that I'm sick because the moment that you speak that you're sick, you can have what you say. Well, don't deny the facts. Like, hey, you have a cough? No, bless God. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm healed. <laughs> you know, and it's like, just, just tell the truth. You know, it's fine. You can say I'm dealing with this, but I'm getting healed. You know, that's, that's how it should be, Right. And these are the things that we have to find out about. See, in our life, if we just resolve it is what it is and we stay there, we will never get to the things that God has for our life. We will never get to the place that God wants us to be. See, sometimes what it is and how it should be are actually opposing forces. Isn't that an interesting thought? Sometimes in our lives, what it is could be, well, there's there's controversy and there's, there's, there's unforgiveness in the relationship. There's, there's, there's just contention in this relationship. That's what it is, and it opposes how it should be. How it should be is that, hey, we're Christians. We should settle this. 
We should forgive. We should be tender-hearted towards one another, offering loving kindness and care and tender mercies like the Word says. See, those two are actually in opposition to one another. And yet I know a lot of Christians that say, well, I can't come to the second service anymore at The Rock because so-and-so is going to be there, and I had a hard time with them. I'm sorry, wait a second. We're believers, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and yet you can't come to the second service. There's only a thousand people, you know, 2,000 people in that church service. What's going on that you have to sit on the other side or that you can't, you know, look at that person in the eye any longer? Work it out. These things are in opposition to one another. Well, pastor, it is what it is. Let me slap you, right? Because that's not how it should be. And we have to, in our lives, aim at and work towards how it should be. So the question for all of us is, how do we get there then? If, it, if, if we're not to just settle for less, if we're not to settle for it is what it is, then how do we get to what it should be? How it should be? Because we can see that in the Word of God. We know that God has things for our lives. And how about this? There are at times an unsettled spirit. Have you ever noticed that? When, when you just realize that this is what it is, but this is not how it should be right? And you don't have that peace from God that's, that, that settles on you and says, no, it's all right. See, there are certain things that I've, I've said, well, wait a second, you know, and then yet the peace of God comes on me. No, leave it alone. But there's other times where I hear, wait, what's going on? What's happening? How is it? That shouldn't be. What do I do with that? You know, there are people that are displaced right now in other nations of the world because of war, and there's a refugee crisis. There are things going on. Wait a second. What? I'm sorry. How many people are being sex trafficked? How many people are being enslaved? How much drugs? It, it, how many people are dying for something that's killing people and destroying lives? I'm sorry, what is it? Well, it is what it is. It's just the world system. It's just a fallen society. It's just the way that it is. I'm sorry, I don't have peace about that. And I don't believe that's the ideal from the Lord. I don't think that's how it should be. So what is the path for things that are in our control, for things that are out of our control? For things that we think we can handle and things that we don't think we can handle. For things that, you know, obviously there are going to be certain things that are outside of our control. So how do we deal with those things in a godly manner? And how do we get to how it should be? I'm glad you asked the question tonight because I got a couple of things that God gave me to tell you today. First one is this. First one of this is if we're going to get on the path to how it should be, the very first thing right off the bat is a little four-letter word that starts with the letter P. We need to pray. Thank you for, for jumping in there. Side note, little rabbit trail. The other day, my wife and I, we, were, we said, well, we need to pray because we're getting ready to go to bed. And all of a sudden, MC Hammer just came out. I don't know what happened, but my wife started rapping, and I started doing the running man. And then we had to get on YouTube and show the kids. And they were like, why are they wearing those pants that look like an umbrella? Like, what's going on there? So anyways, sorry, rabbit trail. Let me come back to the message. We're back now, okay? Praise the Lord. It was fun, though. It was a lot of fun. We had a good time. I got a good running man, by the way, too. But we need to pray. I think this is the most underutilized tool in the box. I think this is the most overlooked weapon of our warfare. I think that this is the thing that if I say pray and you all can repeat it with me and yet we steal things that are not how it should be, then maybe we ain't doing it. It just got really quiet in here. Ding, 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 ding. Why? Because you know, and I know, that we all need to pray more. Is that right? Anybody with Pastor Dan can raise their hand and say, I need to pray more. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being honest. The rest of you guys are liars. You need to pray more. Except for Lupe de la Hoya. Man, that woman can pray. But my goodness, we all need to pray more. We all need to connect with the Father more. The very first thing before we do anything is pray. You can do nothing but pray until you have prayed. And that is the way that we get things done as Christians, is we go and we talk to the Father about it. We go and we ask the Father about it. We go and we supplicate. We supple what? We ask God for stuff. That's really what supplication means. It means wrapping yourself around God and, and giving him your cares, giving him your desires, asking him about life. God desires an intimate relationship with you, and that intimacy doesn't just happen sitting in church. That intimacy happens when you talk to him. That intimacy happens when you communicate, and communication is a two-way street where you talk, that's part of prayer, but also you listen. That's also an underutilized part of prayer. 
Because there may be something that going, that's going on in your life, and you're wondering how you're going to get to the ideal. How, how can I get to how it should be, God? And until you ask that question, you're not going to get an answer. But once you ask that question, take a listen. Quiet your soul. Sit down with a piece of paper and a pen or a note on your phone or, or you know, a dry erase marker on the mirror. I don't know. Get something to where you can write it down and be prepared for when the word of the Lord comes. And if it doesn't come in the time that you've allotted, just have your ear to the Lord for the rest of the day. And as you go throughout your day, keep the lines of communication open. Like I said, this morning when I was preparing this message, I was praying about something totally different. But my spirit, man, I was listening while I was talking because it's a communication. It's a two-way conversation. And I'm praying about one thing, and God says, I want you to go write this down about this message. And literally in a couple of seconds, I had the entire outline, which doesn't normally happen for me. And yet, why? Because I was listening as I was doing what took place was I received from the Lord the instructions. You see this all throughout the Bible. Do you know that Jesus prayed? This is the Son of God. This is God in the flesh. So does that mean God was talking to himself? Absolutely. Okay? Because Jesus, God in the flesh, was talking to Father God who is the Spirit, right? Jesus was showing us how to live the perfect life. If you're going to live the perfect life, you better pray. And like MC Hammer said, we need to pray just to make it today, okay? So that's that's really where this is at. You knew I was going to weave it in somewhere, didn't you? It was coming back, all right? But see, we do need to pray because we need to get a hold of the plan of the will of the Father. Most of the time before Jesus did anything miraculous, before he made a big decision like choosing the disciples, you will find him up on the mountainside praying. Before he walked on water, he was up on the mountainside praying. Jesus, before he went to the cross, was in the garden doing what? Praying. See, anything big in Jesus' life and anything little in Jesus' life, he was praying. When, when the people heard the booming voice out of heaven, Jesus was being baptized one time, but the other time he was praying. Jesus was filled with prayers. You can find his prayers all throughout the Word of God. You know who else was a prayer? It was King David. King David, he was a praying man. In fact, you can find a lot of his prayers in the Psalms. I had you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. I'm going to read verse number 17 through verse number 20. King David has had at this point in the story just a, a, a roller coaster experience. His predecessor, Saul, the first king of Israel, had, had turned and had, had rebelled against God. He was disobedient. And now all of a sudden he's chased David down. He's gone after him. There's been wars and battles. And now all of a sudden David has finally become king over a united Israel. Wouldn't you know that as soon as something good happens in David's life, there's something that takes place that happens that's out of his control. 2 Samuel, chapter number 5, verse number 17 through verse number 20. Look at what happens. It says, Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. So the moment something good happens in David's life, now he's finally king. He's king over united Israel. This is a great day. This is what was prophesied over him. And after years of fleeing and running from Saul and keeping his heart right, now finally the promise has come to pass in his life. He is the king. And right as soon as he is the king, here's what happens. The Philistines gather together against him. Now look at what it says, verse number 18. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Verse 19, so David inquired of the Lord. That really meant he, he was praying. He was asking God for something, right? Saying, Lord, it is what it is. Did you read that in your Bible? No, he didn't say, God, it is what it is, right? Hope we can make it. I'll see you later. This was a good talk. That wasn't what he said. Look at what he says. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? He asked the Lord exactly what the plan was. He's in a stronghold. He's in a safe place. And he says, Should I get outside of the safety of these walls? And should I go and battle against the Philistines? Will you deliver them to me? Look at what happens. And the Lord said to David, Now, sometimes people have a hard time with this. You mean God speaks to you? Yes. Yes, he does. He speaks to us in his word, and he speaks to us in our spirit. You will hear the voice of God if you are quiet, if you're listening, and you're attentive. It won't be like an audible voice like you hear coming out of my mouth right now. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be something inside. Oftentimes, a whisper. And you might wonder, was that me? 
Many times, because God speaks to you in the seat of your conscience, which is your heart, deep within you, you will hear the voice of God. Look at how easy it is. So the Lord said to David, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. God says, yes, go up and fight. He gives him the answer right there in prayer. David didn't just resign himself, well, it is what it is, you know. David asked God, he prayed, asked God about his life, and God said, go up and fight the battle. Look at what happens now. It says, verse number 20, so David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there, and he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. I get the picture of a big giant dam just with the water just breaking through it. Have you ever seen that happen where like the dam gave away? Recently in California, we had one of those dams that broke loose. There was so much water and it poured out and it was just busting through. I mean, water can be a destructive force. We've seen that in Louisiana when it broke through the levees, all that kind of a thing. We saw that in Houston recently with the, the floods and all that kind of a thing. And, and so David says the way that he had won that victory was like the breakthrough of water that God just broke through his enemies. Look at what it says. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. Literally, he translated Baal Perazim means the master of breakthrough. The master of breakthrough. He says, God broke through my enemies, and I'm calling this place, uh, 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 the name of the Lord, the master of breakthroughs. I want to give you some encouragement today that when you're praying, you are not praying to the roof. You are not praying to the four walls that surround you. You are not praying to a dead idol. You are not praying to an antiquated God of someone else, just a, 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 a distant force behind pages or somewhere in the cosmos. You are praying to the master of breakthroughs. You are praying to the one who can change your situation and get you out of what it is into what it should be. There's a mighty prayer warrior, and if you can ever get a hold of his materials, it's amazing on prayer. His name is E.M. Bounds. E.M. Bounds was a great, mighty man of God, and he said this about prayer. He said, God shapes the world by prayer. The prayers of God's saints are the capital stock of heaven by which God carries on his great work upon the earth. John Wesley, another mighty man of God, you've heard of the Wesleyan churches, right? He wrote many of the hymns that we love and that we sing and hold dear for hundreds of years now. He said, God will do nothing except by prayer. See, we have to pray. We have to get into the presence of the Father. We have to talk to God about life. We have to take what it is, give it to God, ask him what it should be, and ask him to change the situation. Nations have been held together. You know, in South Africa, when apartheid was getting ready to rip apart that nation, I heard people that were Christians in that nation saying, we literally carried that nation through apartheid to the other side without a civil war. How? By our prayers. And it's the prayers of the saints today. Listen, I don't care what legislation they pass in our nation, in our state, in our city. I don't care what ungodliness comes against the church. I don't care what hell or high water may come towards us. I'm a praying man. I believe in the power of prayer. I have seen it in my life, and it can change what it is to what it should be. Just tonight, the devil tried. The devil tried, and, and anybody who is in our pastoral prayer tonight heard me pray, no weapon formed against this church service shall prosper, and I prayed specifically about our switcher, which cut out during the first song. See, it's not just what it is, it's how it should be. When I pray, things happen, and that switcher started to crash, and I said, uh-uh, in the name of Jesus, no way, that's not going to happen again. See, when you pray, things change. It's not that you're moving, uh, you know, any, anything around. It's, it's literally moving the hand of God on the earth. It's getting yourself in line with God. God wants to answer prayers, but God still told us to ask because he wants partnership with the church, and he's given his authority to the church. You have the rule. You have the dominion. You have the authority. You need to use it in your prayers. A couple of weak claps. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Many of you guys have heard of Hudson Taylor, who was a great missionary to China, started the Inland China Mission, and just a mighty man of God, had his own things that happened to him in prayer. But listen to this. When he was 18 years old, he wandered into his father's library and read a gospel tract. Now, he couldn't shake the message. Finally, falling to his knees, he accepted Christ as his Savior. Later, his mother, who had been away, returned home, and when Hudson told her the good news, she said, I already know. Ten days ago, the very date on which you tell me you read that tract, I spent the entire afternoon in prayer for you until the Lord assured me that my wayward son had been brought into the fold. Listen, Mama, you've been praying. 
God's been listening. Listen, Daddy, you've been praying. God's been listening. Listen, businessman and businesswoman, you've been praying. God's been listening. Listen, listen, citizen. Listen, person of, uh, of character and, and growing in godliness. Listen, saint of almighty God who's lifting up the things that are happening around you to the Lord. God has been listening, and the answers are on their way. How do we get on the path from what it is to where it should be? Second thing is this, is determine the priority. Determine the priority. You will get this, like I said, from prayer and from the Word of God. God's Word will determine your priorities. God's Word will show you what needs to be important in your life. And if it's, if it's in God's Word, then you can believe God for it in your life, even if you don't see it. So the priority should be on what we do see from the word and what we do receive from God. Like I said, there are times where I'll pray about something and, and, and God will give me a peace. It's okay, leave it alone. That's not your priority, okay? And as I do that and as I leave things alone, I watch God move and God do his thing without me. There are other times where I, I'm praying about something and, and I'm just bugged. I can't settle. I can't get any peace in my spirit about it. I come back to it, and I get that same feeling in my, in my spirit, you know, and, and the Lord may not say, this is this, or this is that, or this is whatever, or do this, or do that. I may just have that feeling like, man, I just don't have any peace about it, and I keep bringing it to prayer. I keep searching after it until I find what the will of God is, and then the peace comes on just like that. That's the priority. Stay right there. Stay where God wants you to be. See, you will get this from the Word of God. You will get this from your prayers. Now, let me tell you what determining the priority means. It means that you set the direction and don't let the situation determine the direction. Okay, I'm going to show this to you in the Word in a second, but let me say that again, okay? You set the direction. You don't let the circumstances determine the direction. Any of you heard of autopilot, right? Maybe you thought about a boat or something like that that's out there on the waters, Waters have currents underneath, also winds up above. The circumstances surrounding a boat will push it in a certain direction. Wind can push a boat out. Currents can take a boat a different direction. It can get battered by the the waves. All these things can take place. But if you set the coordinates of the direction that you want to go, you set that pilot where you want it to be, You determine that in advance, and you set that boat on that course, on that heading. It will go in that direction, and when the currents take it off, it will adjust back on autopilot. That's what autopilot does. Same thing, if the wind starts to push it in another direction, it will adjust back to where it needs to be. Here's what I'm saying. What it is is going to push against your life and trying to get you go in in that direction. But if you set your course to where it should be, then any time the circumstances surrounding the situation start to push against your life, you will get back on track to where you are headed. Everybody's tracking? Okay, let me show this to you in the word. Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter number two. The apostle Paul is recounting his story. He's talking about how he went up to Jerusalem by revelation. He talked to the apostles in private about the message that he had been preaching just in case he was preaching the wrong gospel. He wanted to make sure he's t- saying the right things. They confirmed, Paul, you're on the right track. You got that revelation from Jesus. Keep preaching. Keep doing what you're doing. Okay? He takes a young man by the name of Titus with him. Titus was one of the ministers, much like Timothy, that followed Paul's life and, and that, that uh, the Apostle Paul set up. And in fact, there's a book of the Bible called Titus. And I have a son named Titus. He's a good guy. It's a lot of fun, little guy. And so um, anyways, but, but Titus, he was not a Jew, okay? which meant that he was uncircumcised in the flesh. That was part of one of the, one of the rites of passage of the Jewish people at that time. And so Titus, when he went up with Paul to Jerusalem in the midst of the assembly of believers, it says he was not compelled to be circumcised and to become like the Jews according to the flesh, all right? Now, the book of Galatians is all about the flesh and the law versus the spirit and grace and truth, okay? And so in the book of Galatians, he's setting the stage for this. And in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 4 and verse number 5, he talks about how Titus wasn't persuaded to be circumcised. And he says this, and this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. So in other words, there was believers, there was the church, Peter, James, John, all the believers. The apostle Paul comes up with his companions. Titus is with them. 
And the believers never pushed or persuaded. But there were some secret spies from the Jews that came in, and the Judaizers, these were people that wanted them, even if they were Christians, they said, that's fine, you're a Christian, you still have to be circumcised, you still have to eat this way, you still have to celebrate these feasts, you still have to do all this stuff, right? Back to the law, back to bondage. And so it says that they came in to spy out the liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. Look at this, that they might bring us into bondage. They wanted to trap them into works-based religion rather than grace-based freedom that we have in Christ. Okay? Now look at what it says, verse 5. To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. He says, guys, I determined the course. I set the autopilot to the grace and the truth of God's word. I was not going to be persuaded, not even for an hour, other translations say not for a minute, that that we were not going to submit to their legalistic, ritualistic rules and regulations of the old covenant. We are now a part of a better covenant. We now no longer have to hold to those ceremonies and those traditions to get close to God. The veil has been opened, and we can now enter into the presence of God. When we petition the Father and ask him about life, he hears us. Jesus said, you can go to the Father and ask him. Now we have that entrance given to us. So why would we go back to the bondage of dead religious works to get close to God? That's not how it is any longer. So the Apostle Paul says we did not yield submission even for an hour. We wouldn't even play games with these guys. We would not let them come in and persuade us. We wouldn't let the circumstances and the surroundings of their opinions of our life stop us. In other words, they set the course. They made the priority. The priority is is the truth that we have in Christ Jesus. You don't need to be circumcised to be saved. You don't need to hold to the new moons and the Sabbaths and the festivals and the feasts and the different dietary laws and all the different things any longer to be righteous before God. Now righteousness is given by Christ Jesus, by faith in Christ Jesus. And now if we endure in him to the end, we shall be saved. Is anybody listening today? Lester Summerall said this. He said, you make decisions and decisions will make you. You make decisions, and decisions will make you. When you set the course of your life, when you set the direction, you're setting your destiny. You make decisions, and decisions will make you. Who do you want to be? What is it that you believe is where you want to be in life? You make decisions, and decisions will make you. You will find yourself, as you set the priority, becoming a reality of not just what it is, but what it should be. Anybody say amen to that tonight? Which brings us to the last one for tonight, number three, work towards how it should be. Work towards how it should be. Work towards how it should be. Because I think in our society, I just preached a little bit on the grace of God that we have and the freedom that we have in Christ. And yet that does not exempt us from work. See, I think works have gotten a bad rap in our present day Christian circles at times because we no longer have to work to get ourselves saved, right? But we've forgotten that we do works from our salvation, that there is a place for works, and all of us are workers, the Bible says, who need not be ashamed, approved by God to do the works, that there are good works God has prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them in advance, right? There are many things, many times, many places in the Word of God that God shows us, I want you to do the good things, not to get saved, not to earn brownie points with God, not to get you any more loved by God, but because you love God and because you love people, you will do the works that accompany your salvation. See, we can't let the devil distort this. Otherwise, we will just be an apathetic, lethargic, lazy church, couch potato church that's sitting on the sidelines watching all the superstars on the platform. They're doing the works. They're paid, and they're doing great. You keep going, boy. You keep preaching, girl. Oh, it's good. I love it. And then we go out, and we're ineffective and unproductive in our Christian walk. God wants to mobilize the body of Christ so that we don't just put up with what it is, but that we do the good works so that we can get to what it should be. I believe if we had every Christian in every church in the game, the game would change. And that's where God is taking us. That's what God is doing in us. And that's what God, and I'm saying this by faith, is doing through us. There is revival getting ready to break out on the earth. There's something about ready to happen. 
You know, they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of San Bernardino? Can anything good come out of the Inland Empire? Can anything good come out of the millennials? Can anything good come out of the old people? Can anything good come out of people these days, right? And yet God is saying, I want you to get up, stand up. I don't want you to let up. I want you to grow up. I want you to serve and build up, lift up. I want you to go out there and do the works of God. We need to work towards what it should be. And that means a lot of different things in your life. It means a lot of different things in your situation. For some of you, if you're believing God for healing, that means that you're going to work together with the doctor. You're going to make a plan. You're going to make a help plan. You're going to believe God. You're going to continue to pray. You're going to continue to declare the scriptures over your life and speak out those things and believe God. You're going to continue to take your medicine until the doctor tells you not to, but you're going to do what you can do in the natural. You're going to work your part, and God will work his part. Some of you, prosperity, it means that you need to go apply for a job. Get up off the couch, stop lazing around, hoping that it falls out of the sky. I have yet to receive a job that fell out of the sky. And if you know how that works, would you come tell me? Because I got people that need jobs. I would love to position them wherever the access is or the, you know, the rain cloud is that the blessing's coming down out of or or the, you know, the the HR department head that's going to fall out of the sky. It doesn't work. St. Augustine said this, he said, on your knees, pray as though it all depends on God. Leave your knees and work as though it all depends on you. My goodness, guys, we need to pray as if everything depended on God, but then work as if everything depended on us. God will do his part, we'll do our part. When you put in your natural, God puts in his super, and now you've got a supernatural existence. Let me put it to you like this, we have to work for what we want. We have to work for what we want. The Bible says you, you don't work, you don't eat. Everybody want to eat? You better work, right? You have to work for what you want. You will never reap a harvest you have not sown for. You got to sow the seed. God will provide the rains. He will cause it to grow right? Because the seed has the power within itself to grow, but you've got to sow. Unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, how does that happen? You've got to sow. You've got to give. You've got to sow. You've got to work. You will never reap a harvest that you don't go out there and reap either. Not a thought. Do you know that harvest is work, right? The Bible says those that sow in tears will bring their sheaves in with joy, right? That sheave weighs something. There is a weight that is work. There is pressure and there is, uh, you know, energy that's expressed when you bring in the harvest. We have to get to work for what we want. We cannot just say it is what it is and sit back and do nothing. We have to work towards what we want it to be. James chapter 2, if you want to turn there with me, kind of towards the end of your Bible in the book of James, chapter number 2. You got to know I was going there. Some of you guys have been around church for a while. You knew I was going there talking about faith and works and the place of faith and works. James chapter 2, I'm going to read verse number 14 through verse number 17. Look at what it says. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now, I want you to notice something. He asked, what does it profit? Okay? We all want the profit, but he says, what does it profit if you say you have faith? I'm believing God for this, but you never do anything about it. Does it actually benefit you at all? Look at the next verse. He gives an example. If a brother or sister is naked, and destitute of daily food. Right there, that is what it is. Did you notice that? Brother or sister, hey, they're naked. They're destitute of daily food. That is what it is. But is it how it should be? No. Look at the next verse. And one of you says to him, depart in peace. Be warmed and filled. Okay? Now, is that how it should be? That's how it should be, yes. In the natural, when when you talk about what they said, is that the ideal? Is that how it should be, what they said? That's the picture of what it should be, right? Okay, everybody's tracking with me, right? Now look at the next thing. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Now if I asked you, is that how it should be? The answer to that is no. That's not how it should be, right? Because the ideal is not 
just the ideal in a picture, in a word. The ideal is the reality in the work that we do. Look at what he says. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's ineffective. It's unproductive. I love how the message says in verse 17, it says this, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I just want to shout that at some people sometime when they're talking and you know that they're just talking and it's just hot air, right? And they're talking about these big puffed up, they're pontificating on things that they think that they know out of the word and you know that they're not doing anything about it. I just want to shout at them, outrageous nonsense. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Probably have a lot less people in church, wouldn't we? But it's outrageous nonsense for us to say that we love people and not actually love them. It's outrageous nonsense for us to say that people should be given the word of God and not have church. It's outrageous for us to say that people should be witness to and never tell someone about Jesus. It's outrageous for us to say that we should be reconciled and never humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness. It's outrageous for us to say that we want to prosper and never get up and knock on doors and fill out applications. It's outrageous for us to say that we want to have a good marriage and never go work on the marriage and submit ourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. It's outrageous for us to say, it's outrageous nonsense for us to say any of the ideals without actually putting our legs and our work and our faith behind it and doing the work of God. Yeah. Guys, that's where the rubber meets the road, is that we have to actually do this. Tonight, don't just settle for it is what it is. Yes, that is what it is. Yes, that's how life is. Yes, there are things going on that should not be. Let's not settle there. Let's not allow that. We gotta have some grit on the inside of us. There's gotta be something inside of us that's moved. There's gotta be a compassion that Jesus had that's on the inside of us that moves us. What does it move us to do? What is the path to get us to where it should be? Number one, we need to what? Just to make it today. There it is, third time's a charm, all right? The second thing is this, we gotta determine the what? the priority. Don't let it move you. You move it, right? And finally, we've got to work towards how it should be. If you got something from the Word of the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah.